You're listening to Feathers, a podcast of stories of women walking in faith. I hope these stories inspire you and encourage you to take flight in your own faith. I'm your host, Amy Bennett, and this is Season 10, Episode 3. Feathers is an outreach of Abiding Ministries. Find more encouragement at abidingministries.net. Well, hey, friend, and welcome back to Feathers this week. First off, I want to just say thank you so much for the wonderful welcome back to Season 10 of Feathers. You know, when you take a break, you always just have this great fear that nobody will show back up. But you guys did, and it was just a terrific response to the first two episodes of Season 10. So thank you uh, for that, and um, I'm just so grateful to be back. Well, I am excited this week because I have someone on that I have been wanting to get on for several years now. I am so happy to have on Ruth Cho Simons today. And if you spend any time on social media in the Christian blogging world, you will recognize her as the owner of Grace Laced. Um, That is her online shop where she shares her writing and her painted artwork. She is an incredible artist. She has been an inspiration to me for several years now, and I'm just so happy to share some of her story and her wisdom with you today. So here is my conversation with Ruth. Hi, Ruth, and welcome to Feathers today. Thanks so much for having me, Amy. Oh, I'm so glad to talk to you. Um, I actually have been wanting you on the podcast for a long time. So it's been a long time in coming. I'm glad we got to work it out. Yeah, I'm so glad to be here. So I was just um, kind of going down memory lane and realized that um, you and I, we've been in the same room and you don't even know it probably. Oh my goodness. (laughs) So I went to, um, yep, a loom 2015. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. And I actually pulled, I can't even believe, I, this is what a nerd I am sometimes. I actually still have the like brochure thing that they give you at the conference. No way. And I pulled out actually the session that I attended. It was called What It Takes to Run a Creative Business Online Without Losing Heart. Girl, I can't, that feels like eons ago. <laughs> that really feels like a lifetime ago, but that means so much to me that you were there. And I really feel like that was like the very beginning of a lot of things um, growing and exploding for me uh, work wise. Mm-hmm. And so, so that means a lot to me that you were there. Yes. And um, I, I enjoyed that, enjoyed it so much. And just to kind of fit in the timeline of what I was going through is I had just launched this podcast, okay. um, the spring of 2015. And I attended a loom that fall. Mm-hmm. And I was starting to you know, kind of figure out whether I wanted to do like an online shop or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, but that's kind of how, why I went to that session. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I did end up launching some t-shirts and mm-hmm. journals and whatnot with our, with our podcast art on it. I figured out that's probably not the direction that uh, we were meant to go in, but the mm-hmm. podcast is still going and, and you didn't encourage me on that journey. So oh, that's I'm so glad. kind of funny glad. to look back on. It is funny. And I think, you know, it's interesting that blogging conferences were so common back then. And, you know, we're all learning. We're all just growing one step at a time. And I'm sure if I um, did that session now, I would still say say the same things, but I would have learned so much since then because that was, yeah, four years ago. That's crazy. I know when you say four years, it doesn't seem like it. But like when you think about it, that does feel just forever yeah. ago. Yes. And social media years and internet years. Yes. It's like a lot, doesn't it? It's funny that we say that now. Yes, I know. Oh my goodness. Um, well, like I mentioned, I have um, been wanting you on for a long time and I'm so glad our, our schedules finally aligned. Um, but w- I mean, I've always been inspired by really by the business that you've built. Um, and I guess that's a weird way to say it, but Grace Laced is um, is your business, and that's the way you um, share your painting, your art. Um, so, for those that don't know, let's go step, take a step back a little bit. Tell us a little bit uh, about yourself and Grace Laced. Sure, sure. Um, I'm Ruth Jo Simons. I am a mom to six boys, and uh, my oldest is 17, um, and my youngest is six. And the 17 year olds heading off to college. So we're kind of entering first grade in college at the same time. I've been married to my husband, Troy, for 21 years. And in past seasons, he's been a um, church planter, a youth pastor, a college pastor, a preaching pastor of a church, um, the head teaching pastor for seven years, as well as a headmaster of a classical Christian school that we helped to found. And so um, we've just had ministry in very various different forms in Currently, in our current season, for the last several years, we've been full-time with gracelaced.com, um, which 
began as a lifestyle blog, but ultimately turned into a um, a website in which I get to share my artwork through prints and stationary products, and now um, even an opportunity to sell the books that I've published traditionally through Harvest House. Um, my first book, Grace Laced, came out in 2017, and um, my new book, Beholding and Becoming, The Art of Everyday Worship, launches in three weeks, it's September 10th. Yes, and this is going to be this episode actually going to be launching, I think, that day. So oh, happy launch God. day <laughs> in so the future. Much. How exciting. <laughs> yeah. So, well, okay. So you talked about Grace Slice really starting from your blog. And I know the fir- in the first days of blogging, you know, images weren't really even a thing. <laughs> I don't know if it was that way for um, you when you started, but it was just all text. And then it's kind of, it's really obviously grown um, over the years. So how, how did it start that um, artwork kind of your artwork um, got entangled into like a lifestyle blog? Yeah. So, you know, I think early on in blogging days, we I'd say like 12, 13 years ago, um, the purpose of an image was to just simply have a thumbnail or something that could be shared, right? But then, or, or just to anchor that blog post. And a lot of blogs were written without even images, but then the, um, you know, the arrival of Pinterest, the arrival of the share button on Facebook, that made images a lot more um, like the directing force for getting your words out there. And so then, you know, a few years later, Instagram became kind of a big deal. And at first, you know, early adopters were just, you know, somewhat just relational, getting to know each other, social. But quickly, for those of us who were writing, we kind of saw it as an opportunity to direct people to the blogs where we wrote a lot more, but it was almost like microblogging on Instagram. And I still treat it that way. I still see Instagram as an opportunity for me to um, lead out with words. So you'll find that if you follow me at all, um, I I write probably longer posts than the average person. And but that's just how I've done it for the last seven, eight years. Um, but you know, Instagram is image focus. It's image led. Um, it's a whole platform that's based on curated images. And at first, you know, um, I think most people would just snap a picture of anything. But what we realized quickly was that if you're leading out with a platform that is first image, secondly, words, then your image really has an opportunity to usher in the importance of the words. Meaning if I have this thing on my heart that I really want to say, um, just taking any old picture doesn't do. I have an opportunity to really, whether it's be illustrated or be an opportunity to serve up those words in a clear way. And so as an artist, that presented a really unique opportunity for me because um, in the days when I painted only to create artwork that made much of me, it actually felt really empty. I remember when I first came out of college, the thought of, I just really want to be in art galleries. I just want to be a producing artist. I want to be known as an artist. Any of those thoughts just left me feeling really empty because it was really just about me. But once this opportunity came to use social media and use Instagram in this way, suddenly it wasn't really about me just creating beautiful work. It was about this larger conversation about how God's grace intersects my daily life. And anything I painted, anything I photographed, any beauty I captured with my camera had an opportunity to now turn our gaze and our attention to something bigger than my perspective or my work, right? It was it was a bigger thing than, wow, she painted something pretty. It turned our attention to what does God's word say? What are my insights about this? And so I really saw it as an opportunity to adorn the gospel, you know, as it says, that it's not just that I'm trying to create something that takes people's attention away from the gospel. I wanted that I wanted my readership or my follower to ultimately be captured by the beauty of God's word and the beauty of who Christ is in our lives. And if I could take a photo or paint something that ushered them in closer, then I succeeded. That's the way I thought of social media. And I still think of it that way. And so that really started off a certain way that I wanted to capture images. So in um, my sixth uh, boy was born um, and I had a lot more freedom than it might not seem like it. I mean, those of you who are listening with babies, you're like, wait, there's no freedom when you have an infant. Well, when it's your number six and you have olders who change diapers and start dinner and help put away groceries, yes, 
life changes. And so, and I was a different person. I wasn't the anxious, antsy mom, first time mom that was still like, how do I juggle my schedule? I kind of really understood the rhythm of motherhood by that time. And so um, with number six, I would lay him down for a nap and was homeschooling the boys. And sometimes they would quietly work and I would just start um, painting or lingering a little bit longer on some scripture and letter it out. And that was you know, that was really the early days. Now lettering and painting is kind of saturated in our market, but um, at the time, not a lot of folks were doing it. And so I would simply just stand up from it and go get the baby after his nap and um, take a photo of what I was painting on the desk, which kind of turned into my first, what they call flat lay photos now. Um, and early, some of the early ones, you'll even see a little baby hand in the picture because he'd sit on my lap sometimes while I painted. And so that's really how Grace Laced Art and Grace Laced the Shop was born because um, through through that, people started asking for um, those in prints. And so that's really how it started in 2015. It sounds like it really was a natural outflow of what you were already doing. Um, it just sounds like part of who you are is to is to create this, but yet, um, it, to me, it seems like you really see this as a calling. Do you? Would you say that you see it that way? You know, Amy, I would say that I always felt like it was a calling to participate in encouragement for, for the body. Like I've always thought that my goal is to be a part of encouraging the body of Christ, to teach the Word of God, to create beauty. I've always felt that way. But if you had asked me 15 years ago in the throes of early motherhood, I would not say, no, it, it's my calling to start an art shop and to produce artwork and to share it with thousands and millions of folks. No, because at that time and still is now, my calling looks different. I mean, my calling might be the same, but the way I get to use it is different season by season, right? In that particular season, I was counseling young women during nap times. I was reading books to my little ones. Um, and... I was in the early years of homeschooling children at home. And so I guess my point in saying that is just to say, I definitely feel that we all know in our inner, I mean, our hearts and just in our bellies, some of the passions that we have, but it may look different in every season. And for me, the, the outworking of that in a very public way didn't happen until some of my older kids were grown or were older. I love that you said that because I think sometimes we, I feel like, oh, God has this one big certain call on my life. And if I miss it, I miss it. <laughs> you know, right, it's like right. one thing. Yep. Yes. But I'm finding it's just like you say, is that he has callings today in our everyday. And yes. just as we, as we walk along with the Lord, as we abide, um, he shows us what today, what that, how we work that out. Right. And that's really what's been on my heart and what I've been thinking through for the last two years as I wrote this new book was ultimately we're constantly, you know, just aware through our devices, through all that's available to us. We're constantly aware of really big things that other people are doing. And it's not that big things and big dreams aren't worthy and wonderful. I have big dreams. I aim for big things right now in my life. And I honestly, even launching a book is a big dream come true. But my point in the way I want to serve the body is to remind us all that we're not called to experience God when we finally reach the mountaintop or we finally get across the ocean onto um, the mission field or that we finally experience the Lord's pursuit of us when we step out in faith and we start a nonprofit or we start a major business or we set everything aside and now only paint all day long. You know, those are these huge, big leaps of faith. While we may think that it's a leap of faith to go start something big and new and dreamy and to launch something that puts our names in neon lights, that seems big. But I, my argument is that worship was meant to be big in our everyday, that our seeing his pursuit of us and our being transformed into his likeness happens moment by moment as you choose to be faithful right where you are. And so your day, that listener out there today who's really on her way to picking up her child in Carline or is fixing dinner for a hurting uh, family from church or is caring for a parent who's ill. Those are not big things in the world of social media and it doesn't put your name in a magazine, 
but God is actively transforming you right now. And if we miss that, we miss the process of sanctification in our lives. And so that's my heart. My goal is for us to behold Christ as he's working things out in our everyday lives and just be able to see just how beautiful it is when grace, the grace of God intersects the most mundane and ordinary of our days. I am just nodding a lot over here. I wish you could see me, but that is just, I just love that notion. And I have found, you know, we're on our 10th season of this podcast and we talk a lot about leaps of faith. And mm-hmm. and what I have found is, yes, sometimes it does, you know, take a lot of faith to do that one big step, whether, you know, like you said, nonprofit, adoption, you know, whatever our thing might be, right. writing the right. book. So often I just think that the power of it is once you start walking that out in the everyday, because then it gets hard. And then that's where you really, that's where your faith is really made is in the everyday of walking that thing out. Right. And I think we forget that we're not saved just so that we can barely survive our time on earth. And then heaven as the destination is, you know, the one thing and we, we kind of forfeit life and abundance here on earth. No, we're saved to a life of abundance, whether that looks like material abundance, abundance in passions and time and experiences, or it means abundance because Christ eternal is in our hearts. And so when we are transformed inside, we live a life that's abundant right now. And we don't have to wait for Yes, it will be all changed when we see him face to face, but our transformation through God's word, we're, we learned that that transformation does not only happen when we finally reach heaven. That transformation begins now when we surrender to Jesus. And so I think my, if I had one hope for the next generation, it would be that young women, as they begin to raise their families, as they begin to um, pursue careers, as they look to serve in their local communities, overseas, in their churches, with their neighbors, whatever it is that God's called us to do, that we realize that everything good that we have to offer out there, whatever out there means to you, every good that you have to offer and testify about God's greatness out there will begin in the most boring and unseen place in your life right now. Meaning that conversation you have with the Lord as you're brushing your teeth, that way you deal with um, cleaning out the fridge, emptying your inbox, dealing with your kids today, those things matter. And right now in my 40s, as I'm um, really kind of in a very strong growth season of this career I've developed in this brand that I've built, all this that's happening right now really is sitting on the foundation of a lot that I learned and grew and worked out in my salvation in times that were unseen. And so this book is a love letter to the unseen places in our lives and, and encouraging women everywhere to meet with the Lord right now and not wait for those big more moments. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think this goes right into a question that somebody on um, Instagram, Mary, hi, Mary, she wanted to ask you, how do you, while you're doing the everyday, doing the laundry, the math homework, whatever it is, how do you keep that perspective and how are you intentional about keeping your focus on Christ? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think that the 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 busy and the hustle is a stealer of joy. Like, I am the most unhappy when I feel like I have to produce or perform to please other people, to not um, lose the audience that I have, not lose the sales. Think about how much we live in fear of losing something when we think that we're in control and that God doesn't have our best in mind. That somehow, if I don't hustle hard enough, I'm not going to get it all. Whether that be with, you know, um, what we provide for our kids or how we deal with our finances or the, the, the business that we're building, whatever it is, we can have that scarcity and that fear mentality. And so for me, I think the reality is whatever I have lined out for the day, I have to begin with a mind, a mind that's fixed on the Lord, a heart that's going back to his word, a reminder that he is sovereign and he is in control and this life is not mine. So whether that means that you have to remind yourself that this life is not yours before you start homeschooling you're the, your kids for the day, or you have to remind yourself that 
I'm just a steward. This life is not mine when you go into the office or I'm just a steward. This life is not all mine when you go and get on social media and build that thing that you feel called to building. That will change the way you do it. And so um, I know that that's a really big paradigm picture on a practical level. I would say um, I think all of us need to recognize that you can't do everything in every season. And so you have to choose. You have to choose what season you're in and what's the most faithful choice that you can make. What brings the Lord the greatest honor and glory in your current season. And that might mean setting aside, spending six hours building your social media platform because your kids are young and this is the only time you get to invest in them. Or may- maybe it means that in this season, you're not called to make dinner from scratch every single night. It may mean that in this season, you have a mother's helper. It may mean that in this season, you don't get to go out and do every social event. And for me, that means that... Um, that meant for a season that I never watched TV and I did not um, go to every social thing when I was in the, se- the hustle season of building. And so you, you make choices. And I think it's a lie if we think that we can do everything we want to do in every season and that we can have it all. We really can't. No, <clears throat> no. And I, um, I've got older kids now. I have three, three teenagers and I can totally relate to that, that I think when you start out with a small, small family, early family, that it's like, you feel like it's going to be this way forever. So it's like, I've got to fit it all in because this is the way life is going to be forever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and I think what you and I both have realized is it's not, it is a season yes. and awesome. it's okay if things go by the wayside. I mean, honestly, this, this particular even podcast, like I took a sabbatical and didn't do this season at the beginning of 2019 because my family was in a season that they needed more of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, and it's okay. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and it's, and it's okay. And, um, it's not passing you by just because you learn to rest and you learn to strategize more fruitful living. Yes. So and and, and it, it is, you get in that, that, that scarcity mindset. Cause you're like, Oh, all the other podcasts that are being created, all the other episodes and uh, they're never going to, you know, nobody's ever going to listen again. And what am I doing this for? And, you know, you can just get in that, that scarcity mindset, but you know, it's, you, you do have to return to that truth that, you know, rest is a season and it's okay. And yes. it'll be there. You know, if God is really, truly leading, which I believe he is in this podcast, that the right listeners will come at the right time right. and it'll be okay. <laughs> it's so easy to, so easy to get into that scarcity sure. mindset with a lot of Absolutely. things. <laughs> I fight it every day. Yes. Um, so I want to really um, kind of zone in on um, your experience with parenting because I just, I don't know if you know our history, but I ha- we have um, two biological daughters. They're now 16 and 14. They're getting ready to change their, you know, it's birthday season. But anyway, they're 16 and 14 now. And then we adopted our son who is um, getting ready to turn 14 um, five years ago. We just celebrated five years. And so with you having six boys... <laughs> Um, you know, in a, I guess not, I don't want to say weird, but in a far off way, you have been a kind of a mentor as a, as a boy mom to me. So I I would love to spend a few minutes talking about that. Um, one of the things that you actually talk about, and I want to just bring in what you talk about, um, in, in your book, um, beholding and becoming, and, and really, I love how you did that because it's like, and, and maybe you can talk about this more eloquently, but like your idea is that if we can we become what we behold is, is the, is the premise. And um, so you kind of have this idea and you work, work through these, these sets, these duo sets of chapters about, you know, you, you behold one thing and then you're going to become another thing. Yes. Okay, I was like, do you want to no, add anything else to that? No, it's um, I, I aimed high with an idea that um, takes a little bit of chewing. So, I certainly invite all your reader or your listeners listeners to grab the book, but I will tell you it is um, not a Cliff Notes book. It's not one where you're just going to be like, oh, quick, that's a quick little fix for me today. No, I want you to linger long and chew on it. But really, they are 16 pairs of, um, they're duets of beholding how we can see Christ in some ordinary situation in our lives. For example, when life seems unfair or when you feel like life is mundane and rep- repetitive, there's different areas of our lives that I personally think those are the areas that I never look 
for how God wants me to worship or be changed in this moment. Because I kind of think, oh, I'm just getting through this issue. But then those are the very areas that he's sanctifying us and creating and, and molding us to be who he's intended for us to be um, for his glory and our good. And so, um, yeah, there is a chapter on on the mission field being at our kitchen table and family for sure. Yes. And I, and I just thought, found this fascinating because, and I do, I, I just want to, you know, I don't know, say again, <laughs> what you just said is that it's not just like a simple flyby kind of thing. It is really dip deep and rich. If I can say that right, deep and rich, it's deep and rich. And one thing, just a side note that I love that you did is that you ha- actually have in the beginning of the book, like a glossary of the images um, really from nature that you use throughout the book and that really enhance the meaning of what you're talking about. So it's it's this rich, yes, there's words, but there's also images that, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words that is also speaking. So um, one of the um, one of the things that you talk about is that when we behold the unity of God, that we can become, um, transformed as a family member, as a mom, um, as a dad, whatever that looks like. How is the unity of God um, related to parenting? Yeah. And obviously this is way deeper in a more profound theological concept than I can even get into in my short chapters here. But I'll just give you the quick heart of it in that Ultimately, when we are discouraged or frustrated in parenting, in the way our family culture is, maybe we're fighting with a spouse and we're going, why are we not getting this right? Or my kid's not listening. Most of those times have some version of us going, I want this situation to be comfortable. I want this to feel good. I want to feel like I've accomplished something because in my family structure going well and my kids obeying me, somehow it satisfies that part of us that wants to feel like we're doing good and we've somehow nailed it on life. And so we kind of, in in the easiest way possible, we can look to our parenting to be our worth, to be our satisfaction, to be something that would secure our identities. And so our unhappiest times as parents usually are times when we feel threatened in our worth We're threatened in our um, security and our satisfaction. We feel unsatisfied. We feel like we're giving a lot and not getting much in return, or we feel unsatisfied um, or unsure of our identities. And so the reason why it makes a difference when we think about the unity of God and Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit and what we've been told we are as in Christ, we are brought into that unity. Well, the reason why that matters is because the more we see what God has offered us through our adoption as his sons and daughters, what we've been offered as ones who receive the inheritance with Christ, as we see that he calls us to call him Abba Father, that he's not way off in the distance, that he is close and he is near and he wants a relationship with us. The more we see that and we see that um, in John 17, that that Jesus is saying, hey, just as we are one, God the Father, um, bring my, bring your children in, bring these, these um, saved children of God, bring them into the same unity we have. The more we see that, Amy, the more we're able to go, okay, uh, my parenting is no longer the way I measure my worth. My worth is already settled in Christ. My security and my satisfaction is already s- secured in my inheritance with Christ in God. My identity is already absolutely defined as a child of God. And do you see how when we know those things without a shadow of doubt, we actually have more to offer our kids. We're no longer trying to get them to obey so that we would feel better about our parenting. We would no longer freak out when we have to do it three or four times and they're not just like immediately getting it. Do you see how when the more we study and see that God the Father is patient with us, the more we have the ability to be patient with our children. And so ultimately... The bigger concept is the best modeling of what it is to be unified in a family is seen in what God has offered 
to Christ the Son. And we are brought into that as we're told in John 17, that we are brought into that as adopted children in the family of God. And so that is the beginning of how we can ultimately um, serve in our roles as moms, serve in our roles as uh, leaders of our household, that we no longer are trying to establish a home so that we can earn favor, feel good about ourselves, know who we are. No, those things are secure. And now we can only be extensions and vessels of grace. We can actually be ones who testify to all those things that are already secured in Christ to our children. Yes. And what I love it, how you even go on is just that then those times when they don't, quote, measure up to what you want, <laughs> those are times that we can testify to that grace and then help them and us be transformed into right. that image right. that we are meant to do. And so it's actually a good thing when things don't go well, right. because it's another opportunity to to show show God's grace, really. Absolutely. Because the ultimate goal is not that we hold up an image of who the Simons family is going to be, and everybody better get in line and you better look like this. No, the only one we want to become is like Christ. And so the more we can hold up Christ and say, we're all going to behold him, then when things don't go right and we're arguing or we're fighting or there's serious rebellion or disobedience happening in the home, the part where us, we as moms want to throw our heads back and go, why me? This is so hard. Those are moments we can stop and go, wait, this is the very circumstance in which I have the opportunity opportunity to convey that this is why Christ came. This is why we need forgiveness. This is why we need to be rescued from our rebellion. And this is why he's the only one we can become like. We're not trying to become the Brady Bunch. We're not trying to become the Cleaver family. We are trying to become only like Christ. Yes, yes. It's so hard to remember in the moment, but if Absolutely. if I think in a, I think it is lo- just like you said every day just being intentional with that mindset of this is what we're doing today. We are all trying to become like Christ and just pointing our kids to Christ and you know and pointing out that it is our sin that's that's making things hard. Um but yeah, there is that grace for us to um choose a different way and and to really be transformed. And the reminder also Amy is that I, for any listener out there who feels like, wait, I did that. Do I have to do it again? I mean, nobody says that out loud, but I think all of us kind of feel like, why should I have, why should it be so hard every day? And I think the thing that I am learning and growing in myself is the reminder that, um, sanctification happens one day at a time, one moment at a time. And you're not going to read this book once and be like, I got it. We're not going to take a six week, eight week Bible study and suddenly be like, no, I'm, I'm good. I, I totally behold Christ well now every day. No, it's that every single day you have to take your eyes off of your circumstances as they are and onto Christ who wants to inform you about how to see all things that he's given for your life. Mm-hmm. So, so good. And um, that's just a, just to give people a little picture. <laughs> that's, that's what the book is like. And there's lots more. And I hope everybody picks up a copy. I would love for you to speak to the person who is listening, who feels like they want to share their art in some way that God is calling them to to do that in a more public way. But gosh, how many lies do they hear and struggles do they have about doing it? You know, whether it is, I'm not good enough, nobody's going to care, you know, whatever. And I'm sure you could, you could list more. How have you dealt with that as an artist? Yeah. So it doesn't matter whether you are a um, visual artists, like you paint, like I do, or if you are a dancer, or a musician, anything that you create and you put out for other people to experience is going to come with a lot of trepidation. And we now live in a time where that fear is actually matched with um, likes and hearts, right? You actually see whether or not people respond to it versus, you know, there was a time when you could invite somebody to a performance and they get to experience it. And, and there's a different response to putting a clip on social media and hoping that somebody will discover you or find you or like that, that post. I still have posts that I'll think I spent a long time writing that post, but that didn't go very far. Did anybody read that? Or wow, I I think people skipped over that. So it doesn't matter how many followers you have or how long you've been doing it. There is that part of fear. And I would just say, um, the only two real ways that I've known to 
deal with it at the most, you know, core level is that number one, um, I have to know who my true audience is. And that's not meant to be just a quick Sunday school answer. But if you redefine day by day that your real audience is Jesus, and that if you die today, you would be proud of the work that you've done, that you could stand before him, knowing that you wanted him to be pleased and no one else, then it frees you. It frees you from feeling the fear of whether anybody likes your work, whether you attracted attention, whether you put the right hashtags on for people to find you, whether it felt better than anybody else's, right? That it frees you from that. If all you're doing is ultimately saying, I want to make him proud. I want to reflect um, him as an image bearer. And that ultimately that's my true audience that frees you up to do the work. And ultimately for any creative out there, your very best work will come out of freedom and not fear. Because if you're fearful and you're constantly like worrying about what everybody thinks, um, you might put out a few good moments of work, but ultimately fear will drive you to create rigid and uncomfortable work and not free and beautiful work. So that's one area is that I have to, I tell myself every day, I have to remind myself day by day who my true audience is. And then secondly, um, I actually make it a point to not um, constantly evaluate, scroll, and follow and look at people who do work just like me. So mm. that's just a that's just a practical thing I've learned. Doesn't mean that I don't stay friends with those people. Doesn't mean I can't pop in and and admire their work. It just means that I don't want to fill my social media feed or my mind day by day with an influx of what the top 20 people who are doing what I want to be doing, what they're doing all the time. Because really that's that's me ultimately not having any fresh ideas because I'm literally just going to be seeing what somebody else has done and how I have no new ideas because I'm just watching what other people are doing. And so it actually helps me so much to get outside of my industry. And that's why this book is filled with images from nature, because I, for one, have to get off social media and get off of self-service and Wi-Fi and go experience what the Lord's made and experience what beauty I find outside of what other artists and other creators have done. And so that's what I do. But for you, it might mean that you go and experience a, a musical or you go and um, if you're a podcaster, maybe you go experience um, a painter's work. Maybe as an artist, you go experience um, a symphony. Whatever it is, get outside of your immediate industry so that you're inspired by something other than the person that you're trying to emulate um, because there's no freedom in that. Mm, that's so, so good, Ruth. Thank you for sharing that. Um, well, I, d- I want to touch on, as we close, I just want to touch on back to um, the glossary that you have in this book. And I just absolutely adore it. Um, so at the beginning, you know, you talk about, it really is a glossary of all the images that you see. So like, for example, um, when you see, you talk about like, when you see bees, you, it makes you think about workers that produce great dividends. Mm-hmm. Or when you think you see bluebells, you think about humility. Mm-hmm. When you think about butterflies, you think about transformation. So that's the way it is. And it's a, it's a long list. And you see all these images through the book. It's so beautiful. But I have to go off script a little bit with these and ask, um, because this is Feathers, Faith, and Flight. Mm-hmm. And I know that you've painted with feathers before because I've bought your work. Mm-hmm. What do you think about when you paint with feathers? Well, You know, I think just like I described in the glossary, I'm sure there's something out there that says what historically images represent. And that I didn't refer to those. These are really just reflections of the way I feel. And feathers for me feel light. They feel free. And they feel like the very thing that God provided in the most amazing, you know, aerodynamic way that something that light and that intricate and that delicate would cause, um, the most unlikely thing like flight, right? And so um, when I think of birds, when I think of flight, it's always about freedom. And when I think of a feather, I really think, my goodness, that is one feather in a whole array of feathers that causes something like that big old bird to get to, to have to lift off. You know what I mean? And so yes, it, it's actually functional. I didn't th- I it, hadn't thought about right. that. How functional they are too as well exactly. as like beautiful so of and light. They're beautiful. Of course they're beautiful. Of course I love to paint feathers, but ultimately in my mind whenever I think of it I go 
you know, in some ways it's even like a picture of the body of Christ that we all fulfill that purpose. We all fulfill the purpose of the whole thing being able to do what is unlikely. Flight seems so unlikely. And yet the feather is what God created for one feather to join forces with all the other feathers to make this entire, um, the species to be able to, um, get to the next destination. So <laughs> wow, that's I, I love that. Oh my goodness. I'm going to love my paintings any even more. <laughs> so you do have a Psalm for those listening. You do have a Psalm 91 four, um, with, I guess it's just like a set of wings really. And the other one that I have that I'm thinking of, um, is the painting that you have where you talk about children are a heritage from the Lord mm-hmm. and then like the frame of feathers. So yeah. I love both of those. Those Aww. are my favorites. Thanks with for feathers. That. Oh, I love that. Yeah. All right, Ruth. Well, I just appreciate so much this time and um, just thank you for all your work and thanks for being on today. If people want to connect with you um, and get the book and um, maybe something else you have to offer, how can they do that? Well, thank you so much. So um, the book is available everywhere online, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I believe it's at Hobby Lobby and Sam's Club. Um, You can purchase it anywhere online or through gracelace.com, which is the website in which you can find all my artwork um, and all the products. And you can learn more about my speaking schedule and follow me on Instagram through Ruth Joe Simons. That's R-U-T-H-C-H-O-U-S-I-M-O-N-S. All right. Well, thanks again, Ruth. Thank you, Amy. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Ruth. I just think she is just so incredible. Uh, What I love about Ruth is that she reminds me constantly that we are not called just to one thing in one way. Our faith journey really is about a relationship and keeping our priorities and focus on God every single day. You know, whether our calling uh, at the moment in our season is in parenting or in business or creative work or in our church, um, in that beholding is when we become more like Christ. And that is our ultimate aim. So guys, thanks for listening this week. Um, I would love for you to follow us over on social media. We are on Instagram and Facebook as Abiding Ministries. Uh, Also would appreciate so much if you guys could leave reviews over on iTunes. That helps people find the podcast and know that it's a good one to listen to. There are a lot out there today. So appreciate that so much. All right, guys, thanks for your time for listening. Um, I hope it was an encouragement to you and we will see you next time on Feathers. 